Great. So I'll talk about security consideration for uh, PORREP, uh, what I call proof of useful space rather than PORREP. Um, and yeah, let's just introduce how Filecoin proof of useful space works. Um, we have this protocol that consists in two phases. One is initialization phase, where we have the proof of replication, meaning that we take the data and we encode it into a sector, um, and then we submit the sector to the, to the chain. And this means that I commit to store this data for you. So later on, sorry, yeah, later on is the execution phase where I have to maintain and to, to prove that I maintain this, uh, this um, storage for the network. So this consists into an audit, like I have to answer some random queries and show that proof again that I have still the, the, the data on the chain, uh, or on the local disk. Uh, so these are two different flavors, window post and winning post. Okay, so uh, how more in deep detail proof of useful space works and why it is secure as we have it now. So we have this initialization phase that I was uh, explaining where the storage provider uh, has to prove that they have a unique, a physical unique copy, a replica of the data. Uh, and then we have, um, this happens only once, so once we have this, we submit it to the chain and uh, we have to, to prove that the encoding was done correctly so everybody can rely on this piece of commitment or the information that I submitted in the first place. So this is done by pre-committing. I first commit to the data I want to, I claim I will store. Um, and this is always in, uh, in pieces of sectors, what we call a sector of 32 gigabytes. Um, and I have also to show that this encode of the data into a sector was done according to some protocol. So uh, this uses some, some DRAN bacon, like this uh, randomness um, bacon, in order for the storage provider to open some random position and show that these are consistent with the operation of the, the sealing operation that was required to, to be done on the data. Okay. Um, so what exactly we do during sealing? So we take some replica ID, uh, which is the, some, some small number, some small uh, information, and we do some complicated uh, computationally heavy operation, which is this labyrinth, uh, in order to, to compute some large encoding key that we will use to uh, seal the data, to encode the data. So we will add up the data together with this large encoding key that we, we obtain during the complicated operation. And we obtain like that a replica of the data. And what we commit to store uh, is the replica. Okay. Let's see a first attack on this initialization phase. So what happens uh, if, like what's important here that I really have to store 32 gigabytes. So this is what I'm claiming, that I will, I will have these 32 gigabytes of space dedicated to the not network and not less. And this is why we do some encoding on top of the data in order to make sure it's uncompressible. So what I can do to attack this and to claim 32 gigabytes of storage without really storing that much. Um, as a storage provider, I can, if I am allowed to, to pick up the data I want to store, I can just compute this uh, from replica ID. I do this complicated uh, operation. I have the, the encoding key right there. And because I want to cheat on how much I store here, so I want to store something compressible, I will just pick the, the data to be something that cancel out the key in the encoding. So if I pick the data wisely, I will just have a bunch of zeros here and I will just store zero instead of a true replica of 32 gigabytes. So that's an attack and this is an attack uh, given that the storage provider is allowed to choose what data they are able to store there. So one solution to, uh, to get rid of this attack is to have the replica ID depending on the data I want to seal inside the replica. So this means that I, I have to 
pick the, the data beho beforehand and commit to store this specific data. Uh, so I do this computation depending on the data. But we have something smarter, the SnapDeal protocol that allows us to just do some first to, to steal some sector of anything. And then, then the data can be picked by the storage provider by independently of this key because the storage provider is constrained to use something outside his control, which is the DRA and randomness bacon in order to not be able to do this attack where it cancels out the key, okay? So, yeah, have to keep in mind that always the replica should depend on the data in some way or the adversary should not be able to pick the data once they know the key. Okay, let's go to uh, proof of space time. Once now we are convinced the replica is generated correctly and uh, the storage provider committed to the replica into the chain, um, we are ready to, to ensure that the data is stored over the time continuously. So this is done by proof of space time, which requires the, the storage provider to uh, generate new proofs like uh, continuously in order to, to ensure that. So we have the execution, uh, which is uh, this proof of space time. Uh, which consists in two different ways of querying the, the storage provider. So these are audits um, to ensure that the storage provider still stores the replica. So the storage provider will use DRAND again, the, the random beacon, uh, to derive random challenges and to open parts of the replica corresponding to the, those random positions and the verifier, anyone in the network, can verify that these proofs are correctly and consistent with the publicly no commitment to the data in the replica. Questions? Yes. I had a question. So uh, can you go back uh, basically to the part with the CC? So you mentioned that the, uh, this attack can be elim eliminated that uh, in the way that we know what's the data, right? But what happens uh, in the CC case? It, it's not obvious to me, that, does, they, does this mean that this attack will work on the CC sectors? Uh, so, because we, we will have the replica ID, the input to this computation of the key, depending on the data, uh, it means that you already commit to the data. So you, you, this will generate something that will not be cancelled by the data if the data was inputted here. So this cancels the attack. Does it answer your question? So you have no control of the output here, yeah, the, right? Yeah. But if the, you can pick the data after you do the computation and you know the key, then you have this attack. But if the data is already your input to the computation, you cannot change it afterwards. You end up in a endless loop, right? Like you pick your data, then it changes your, your replica key. Then you would need to change the data again. Then that changes your replica key, and so on and so forth. Right? So you cannot find data that matches the replica key. Yeah, you should not be able to pick the data after you know the key. Okay. Um, yes. So now we are in the execution phase. So I was saying we are challenging the the storage provider to show us that it has position in the replica still stored in in the disk. So we just ask random positions using this random bacon, and the storage provider will, uh, uh, will just uh, publish a proof that they still have the positions. And this is small because we have little position to check. So security of this. We want to ensure that an adversary, a storage provider that deletes the replica, will not be able to answer correctly. So having a fraction of the replica should not allow an adversary to be successful in, into this challenge phase where they have to prove they still have the entire replica, right? They know all the, posi uh, all the random positions here. Okay, so we have different ways to ensure this uh, security. And I will talk about security models. Um, in, um, okay, this, I think there is some text that you cannot read. I'll try to, <laughs> sorry for that. So we have latency and cost model. So in the latency model, we, um, we query uh, the, the adversary and we make sure that the recomputing this replica 
in order to answer the challenge takes more time uh, than allowed to answer the challenge. And in the cost model, we also query the, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, we query the, the storage provider and we make sure that it costs more to answer these queries if you, uh, if you delete the replica than just storing it for the amount of time between two queries. So it costs like uh, in the resources you have to use for answering the query. We'll wait to make it white. Any questions here? Yeah, so the, the cheating strategy of recomputing parts of the replica in order to answer these queries, uh, it's not paying off in both cases. Okay, so um, I'll talk about uh, proof of replication in more details and why, how it's done today. So we have the data, I said, that you uh, saw with a key and you obtain this replica. And we picked uh, heavily like a very slow uh, encoding process that this operation is computationally heavy and it takes a lot of time in order to generate the, the key. So this is in, intentionally because we want to have this security that generating, like removing the replica will cost you in time more than just storing it and reply the, the challenge. Okay. And now we'll talk about slow decoding. So why is decoding slow? Uh, can we make it faster? So in this, um, like a uh, ceiling process, we have the data plus the, the, uh, the key, and then we have the replica. And what we have to store is only the replica. So when, when somebody asks us back the data, we have to do a decoding of the replica back into the data. So what is done today, it's very symmetric. In order to obtain the data back from the replica, it's just adding back the key, so you obtain back the data. It's the reverse operation, which is actually symmetric, right? So you have to do the ceiling again, this expensive, heavily computation, which takes a lot of time in order to recover the data. And this is slow. So we were thinking, why not making faster? And let's imagine the scenario where this decoding is faster. So there is an attack here. So if we can decode into the data in a faster way than just rerunning this expensive computation, there is a way for the, an adversary to cheat on the storage capacity uh, when, they, when they, they commit to different replicas. So if we have some data like zeros that we want to, to, to seal into a sector, so we obtain this replica first, um, what an adversary can do is to continue doing sealing based on this replica, which will be the new data, and this key, so we take this, and now our data is the new replica. We have a new key that is generated correctly, um, but we know that decoding this back to this is fast, right? So we obtain a new replica R prime, right? Great. And decoding, remember, decoding back to the first replica is fast. So when we are challenged to, we don't store this anymore, and we claim to store both. We claim to store replica R and replica R prime. And we will not be detected in our cheating strategy because when we are challenged R, um, we, will, we will just de decode fast. So we will just obtain back R without storing it all the time. Because I, I said the assumption is that decoding is faster than encoding. Unsealing is faster than sealing. So this is an attack, and I can claim to, uh, to store two sectors at the price of one. So we cannot do that fast and sitting. It has to be as slow as um, the, de the recomputation of an adversary of a replica. Okay. Uh, so back to our table. So, which is, yeah, not visible. Uh, so I was saying that we need for the security, the adversary is uh, computing uh, the replica slowly and expensive, that this computation is slow and expensive. 
Uh, I think I'm fine. Like, uh, I don't need to necessarily see the table. Uh, and the uh, honest storage provider, because we want efficiency, um, has to compute the replica fast and cheap. So they, the, it's a bit of a contradiction because we know that Versary has extra power. They, they can store some different elements. So we, sh we know for sure a storage provider doing sealing doesn't know anything, doesn't have the sealing process. Uh, like it comes from nothing and it only computes this. Uh, the adversary did the sealing process and wants to delete the replica, but may store some smart values in, in the sealing process in order to accelerate the recomputation of the replica. So it has advantage over uh, honest uh, storage provider. So it cannot be um, more, it cannot be slower and more expensive than it is uh, the honest, okay? So we will look at this ratio, which is important, um, between the, the latency by the honest storage provider and the latency needed by the adversary that is able to store at most 80% of the replica or any other intermediate value that was generating during the ceiling. So this is the adversary power is like having any possibility of storage of 80%. Um, and while the, the honest one doesn't have any of this. Okay, so this means that the honest one will always take longer than the, this adversary that has some privilege, right? And our research goal is to make it be at, it would be amazing to be the same cost, but be as close as one. This ratio should be as close as one. Um, so we are looking at either making this smaller, like the honest uh, should go down, the honest latency or the adversary latency goes up, right? But these this are uh, kind of depending on one another. And remember the seal stack attack that I was just uh, mentioning, which means that regeneration latency of the adversary has to be bigger than the response time and the decoding latency. So we cannot expect to have fast unsealing because this should be uh, larger than the regeneration latency. Okay, so we have this kind of tensions between different, uh, different parameters. And here I had something that should have been visible. Um, just doing the same analysis for the cost model, where we have the cost of a storage provider, which honestly computes the replica, and this is the, the computational cost and the resources they use, and the cost of an adversary, which all, stores 80% of some pieces of replica or other stuff in between, um, and uh, the cost that they, they um, need to recompute the replica in order to answer the challenges. So same, we want to make it as close as one, but um, it has to pay off for the adversary, and one we lower one of this. So if we have the cost of the, the adversary going, going down, no, if you have the cost of the honest, uh, honest storage provider going down, this immediately will mean that even the adversary can benefit from this, um, uh, from this improvements. So that means the cost of the adversary is going down, and this means that the pooling time will be shifted, so it will be shorter. We have to uh, query more often, um, even the, the honest, honest guy, because the cost of the adversary goes down. So these are intention, and we have to look at the ratio rather and, than at each cost separately. Just focusing on in, like increasing cost of the adversary will make cost of the honest guy increase as well, which is not our goal, and the other way around. So yeah, I think, yeah, the takeaway is like, look at the, focus on the ratios, keep in mind attacks that uh, don't allow you for speed ups, like magical speed ups and let's try to improve this uh, cost time uh, security. Any questions?